I am talking on knowledge transfers from ancient India and uh, it's a bit intimidating to talk at a conference of this quality because I typically talk to translate most of the scientific concepts to a lay audience and I know this is by no stretch of imagination a lay audience. So I beg you to indulge me because this could be elementary stuff for you. So, uh, so this is how ancient India is positioned in the popular narrative. So you have things like, uh, we know Indus Valley civilization, oldest civilization. People talk about Aryan invasion theory around 1500 BC, which displaced the existing people to the south, brought Hinduism, Vedic practices. They present linguistics, steppe, Anatolian hypothesis, genetic data points, and say that's the evidence. They place Buddha around 500 BCE and say it brought rejuvenation to the Indian society. Around 325 BCE, they have Alexander coming in, followed by Indo-Greco uh, kingdoms, bringing in science, math, technology, philosophy, and writing to India. And the very famous synchrony of uh, uh, Sandra Kutters with Chandragupta Maurya. This is not exactly the height I would have wished for, but uh, anyway. Uh, with Chandragupta Maurya and Sheetan Kering to the Western timelines. A little high. Yes, I think so. Thank you. Uh, also, uh, you see things like Islamic contact brought uh, architecture, arts, and music to India. And finally, colonial modern contact brought modernity to India. The bottom line of all of these things is that we have a young Indian civilization. Unfortunately, there are a whole lot of researchers now who are not at all in the ecosystem of academia who are coming forward and cracking open some of these narratives. So today you have things like archaeology which shows very ancient settlements going back to 7500 BC and even earlier. We have a lot of noise out there about genetics, but the bottom line in my best estimate is that it's inconclusive. It primarily talks about a ma male-driven genetic inflow. Unfortunately, the direction is not very clear. There is no notion of a direction if we had a directional derivative in genetics, then we could clearly say what is the direction of genetic flow. Instances of data points this side or that side of the spectrum do not establish a direction, unfortunately. The discovery of Saraswati Paleo channels have brought into focus accounts of Rig Veda time period. We have a lot of analysis of books of the Rig Veda which show an east-west migration. Analysis of several astronomical observations show great antiquity. If you analyze the philosophical systems that show very deep Indic content in other systems, all this hints of very ancient settled people whose long knowledge, gestation, and learning has impacted the world. I hope I'll make a case for that in this 20 minutes. So I'd like to position that India was a source rather than a sink for knowledge. So uh, very briefly, when people say, all right, what is the knowledge that existed in India? We know that there existed so many philosophical strains in this country, in, in India, for a very, very long time. Whether we talk about the various schools like Nyaya, Yoga, Vaisheshika, Samkhya, Purva Mimamsa, Uttra Mimamsa, Jain, Buddhist works, all of these things involved very deeply scientific ways of looking at nature, looking at the nature of reality and trying to express our uh, position on Earth. So I won't go into uh, reading each of these things in deep. So the same thing expressed in a different way. Indians were concerned with what are the valid means to acquire knowledge or pramana. And things like uh, uh, perception, inference, comparison and analogy, postulation, derivation from circumstances, non-perception or negative proof, or relying on the word of ex experts. What you see is that there's a spectrum of understanding what is valid in terms of what kind of knowledge can be internalized. And you see that Indians went through the gamut of what you can imagine. So the various schools of thought can be put to the Samkhya, for example, which took perception and which took inference. The Charvakas took only perception. Buddhism took perception and inference. If you take Advaita, Advaita is very open, it takes perception, inference, comparison, analogy, uh, postulation, and so on. Bottom line of all of these things is there is evidence in the philosophical works of very deep, incisive ways of looking at the world and knowledge generation. So this is my methodology. I would like to make a case that India was a sink, uh, for, rather a source for knowledge and not a sink. 
And in order to do that, I'd like to first enumerate the time periods for knowledge transfer, enumerate the routes for knowledge transfer, I'd like to document the actors and artifacts of knowledge transfer, and elaborate on the impact of knowledge transfer in the various periods and other civilizations. In doing so, I need to critique the existing narratives. This falls center and square of what uh, Dr. Kalyan spoke in the morning, that we need to have a new paradigm over here. We need to critique the existing narratives. They got layered and nuanced and layered narratives that reference each other and build an artifice that says that India was a sink for knowledge from the Greeks, from the Babylons, from the Egyptians, and so on. So if we, if we had to rebut these things, there's an enormous brick wall out there which we need to push against. So this is one very, very small attempt at doing that. So here's my enumeration. I claim that knowledge outflows have occurred in India in all of these time periods, whether you talk about the Euphrates, Tigris, Nile uh, uh, areas, 3000 BCE to 500 BCE, the Mycenaean, oops, the Mycenaean to Pythagorean era from 1300 to 300 BCE, post Alexander 300 BCE, Buddhist and Hindu outflows to China and Southeast Asia, the Abbasid Empire 700 current era, Delhi Sultanate, Mughal period, and finally the colonial period, all the way from 1700s to present. I, I claim that there is knowledge transfer in every one of these time periods. So when somebody says knowledge went out of India, the very first question is, all right, how did it go? Who are the actors and how did it go? So I'd like to talk to you about the routes for knowledge transfer. Here's the first route. So we know that there are Vedic records of migration to the west, maybe from 3000 BC, to refer to the works of uh, Shekhan Telegiri, you can see some of that. In the Saraswati era, climate change, climate change induced migration around 2000 BCE. There is evidence in Mitanni, Hittite, Elamite, Canaanite, and Babylonian contacts between 2000 to 500 BCE. Then the Mycenaean period of Greece, around 1000 BCE, that is a time when you found a lot of uh, similarities in the stories that India, Indian Puranas have, as well as the Greeks have. You find a lot of uh, similarities in this period. There is evidence for these assertions is from internal evidence of the Vedas, correlation of climate change records, appearance of Sanskritic people in Mideast to Bosphorus, echoes of Indic thought in these cultures, strong parallels in stories of astronomy and heroes, and finally, one more route is travel by Greek scholars to India. Time period is 3000 BC to 300 BCE. Route for knowledge transfer two. In this, from post-Alexander, post-Alexander we know that there's a whole bunch of Indo-Greek kingdoms all the way from Greece up to the borders of India. We also know Chandragupta Maurya pushed all these guys out and uh, maybe outside of uh, Gandhara. So this also served as a conduit for transfer of knowledge from uh, one culture to another. This is the third route for knowledge transfer, the Silk Route. The Silk Route is uh, to China, Middle East, and beyond from 300 BC to the medieval period. You can see that India was connected to the Silk Route all the way from China to Southeast Asia, going into the Middle East area, all the way into uh, Europe. This was the typical uh, travel routes. And one of the examples I often talk about is a Boer manuscript. In my second talk that I'll do on Sunday, I'll talk a bit about the Boer manuscript in, in relation to antiquity of Indian medicine. The Boer manuscript was found in Kashgar on the Silk Route. It's one example of how Indian knowledge found itself on a trade route. The fourth route for knowledge transfer, the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. This is a port sailor's document. When the Roman sailors came to trade with India, so this document at least recovered, which said where are all the ports where they could trade. And what you see is on the west coast of India, you have a whole lot of ports and some on the east coast of India too. They enigmatically called it spice trade, but it's far beyond spice, Ayurveda, drugs. Uh, uh, India was a pharmacy of the world, if you could call it that. And uh, a whole lot of these kind of trading took place. And the route was through here to the Red Sea onto the Mediterranean lands, that was the route. So this is approximately 200 BC to find at current era. Knowledge transmission route five, this is the beginning of the Muslims, the Muslim transmission of 700 current era to 1600 current era. Here I'd like to call out first the Abbasid. We know that approximately 711, that's when Sindh fell to uh, Bin Qasim and that prompted a lot of exchange of Indic information into Baghdad and from there on to other places. We go back. So at that time, the Islamic empire ranged all the way from here 
through this Middle East, through Northern Africa, through Morocco, up to the southern part of Spain. So this formed one more route for knowledge transmission. And it's not just the Abbasids. We also know Al-Biruni and a whole lot of other Muslim uh, uh, scholars. Route for knowledge transmission six is the European church travelers. I'd like to show you from 10th century to 19th century, a whole lot of uh, church missionaries came to India. And these were also people who took information out. There were translation schools in Toledo. Toledo is in the northern part of Spain. The southern part of Spain, uh, Cordoba, that was the Muslim area where the Sanskrit works were translated into Arabic. In the northern part of Spain, the Muslims, uh, the Christian monks, their only job was to translate Arabic works into Latin and inject that information into Western Europe. So that took place uh, in between the 10th and the 13th centuries. Then the colonialists from 16th century to 20th century, the Portuguese, Dutch, French, and British, all of these were conduits for knowledge transmission. So what I've done so far is I have first called out the problem. I've enumerated the routes for knowledge transfer. Now I'll jump into some instances. These are not by any stretch of imagination complete at all. I'm just pulling in a few instances here and there. You may, you may read my paper for a larger sample, but one will have to write encyclopedias to uh, account for all of the knowledge transfer. Ancient migrations, how did they occur? Typically, if there was some kind of a problem, for example, in this paper in Nature, 200 year drought cycle doomed the Indus Valley civilization. And this paper that talks about the Saraswati area, about the climate change and what caused the decline of the Harappan civilization and so on. All of these things suggest that when things like this happen, you will have a migration of people. People will go because people's lives dependent on river, river water and things of that nature. If the water goes, what, what are you going to do? You can't pump it. You don't have electricity to pump it from miles and miles away. So you just go pick up your family and go, whether you've built a temple or an artifice or the Sphinx, you leave it and you go where there's water. So this is reminiscent of uh, ancient migration perhaps. This is from the Indo-Pakistan migration at that time. But a very similar technology you can imagine, bullock carts, people putting their uh, belongings and moving. This paper over here from 2013 talks about empty DNA from the early Bronze Age to the Roman period, suggests so a genetic link between the Indian subcontinent and Mesopotamian cradle of civilization. Basically, in common language, they found some ancient skeletons belonging to the Roman era in Syria. And an analysis of those skeletons showed that it was genetically related to northern part of India and Pakistan. So once again, uh, uh, the question to ask is, how did that genetic material find its way over here in this period? And uh, it's probably this. Here I'd like to talk a little bit about the time frame of 1900 BCE. In 1900 BC, there were no Aryans or Dravidians. I just call them Indian civilizations. I took this from a secular source and that talks about all this, but I would never call it that. So there were Indians living over here and in this part of the world, the Hittites, oops, sorry, the Hittites and so on in this part of the world. Here were the Greeks uh, living in this part of the world, Iranian pastoral people, all of Africa, pastoral people, all of Europe, pastoral people. Here in Shang, you had a civilization going on. In Africa, here in Egypt, you had a civilization going on. This is the world approximately in this time frame. And here I've explored this particular region to show the Mitannis, the Hittites called the Hatti people, and the uh, Kassites over here, later on the Babylonians over here, and the uh, Egyptians in this part of the world. So if we find Echoes of Indian thought in these cultures, the question comes to mind, how did it get over there? So one, one thing I'd like to point out is in this part of the world, in Kassites, this is over here, approximately over here, where in Dilmun, even today, we find the Indus Valley civilization seals, where Bahrain is today, that is Dilmun, and you find uh, seals from Indus Valley civilization. We know there existed a trade between people from here to here, even during the times of Harappan times and so on. So very clearly, there was also knowledge transmission and uh, things of that nature happening over here. So if you plumb, when is the earliest Egyptian medicine and what was it all about? There are two or three very important papyrus. One is the Smith papyrus, which is dated to 1500 BCE, which contains magic, trauma, surgery, gynecology. The Ebers papyrus, same time frame, the Cahun papyrus in this time frame. And all of these things have got very similar echoes of what is there in the Atharva Veda. Atharva Veda also has got a lot of uh, uh, 
prescriptive medical uh, ways of doing things including spells including uh, prayers to gods and so on a very similar kind of ecosystem exists over here also in this uh, 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 article this gentleman royal talks about how plants and materials from india were in use in egypt and he, he says even in that very early time frame there's knowledge transmission from india to this part of the world if you look at the mitanis hittites and the kassites I put over here a typical attribution cycle, if you call it. If you look at Charaka Samhita, for example, Charaka Samhita says that Brahma gave that knowledge to Ashwini's. Ashwini's gave that knowledge to Indra. Indra gave that knowledge to Bharatwaj. Bharatwaj gave that knowledge to Punarvashu Atreya. Atreya gave that knowledge to Charaka. So this is a citation trial. You find on this part of the world, the Mitanis used to invoke Indra, Varuna, and Ashwini's. in their peace treaties with the egyptians or somebody else they used to invoke these gods very clearly the knowledge exists over there one more anecdote when the egyptian pharaoh imenhotep 2 in this time frame when he fell ill the mitanni king sent a healing statue of shauka shauka shown with a lion very similar to durga the lion even today in india we use that as a as a as a healing thing we pray to durga and so on the hittites they suffered through a 20 year smallpox in 1322 bce that ended their civilization after that they had healers called hasawa who used herbs roots minerals and such things and their uh, uh, deity female deity of healing was called kamru sepa it's linked with varuna and it traps the disease demon in a bronze pot and saves life very very cryptic even in india today we know if you store water in a copper pot overnight it has got some antibiotic properties in the morning maybe it is clear to drink and the people who are suffering from smallpox seem to have said it traps the disease demon in a bronze pot and saves life very very intriguing but an echo of some thoughts over here the oldest babylonian akkadian medical text is around 1800 bce once again it contains rational examination logic therapy very similar to ayurveda uses exorcism to treat illnesses and curses the kassite medical letter archive from nippur shows that the treatment was based on uh, herbal medicine and spells uh, i don't want to talk about this so here is one more instance I talked to you about a very ancient time frame first. I talked to you about the Babylonians, I talked to you about the Kassites, the Mitannis and so on. Now I'm jumping forward in time and coming to the the Greek period from about 500 BC and so on. Uh, perhaps the most well-known person is uh, Pythagoras who these gentlemen Albert Burke in uh, 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 A. N. Marlow and G. R. S. Mead in these works, they talk about how Pythagoras came to India and he learnt his philosophy, he learnt his mathematics and everything, and went back. When Pythagoras went back to Greece, they called him a madman. They called him a madman because he stopped eating meat. He became a vegetarian, and then he also started a Gurukulam style of school, and he believed in transmigration of souls. very very indic kind of thought process is suddenly injected into greece out of nowhere at all and that's why they called him a madman because it's not uh, similar to their culture and his gurukulam style of schools were also adopted by his successors socrates aristotle others uh, plato they they borrowed a very similar gurukulam style of school where there's a head acharya in charge around him is celibate uh, male disciples and others 5 minutes more oh goodness i sh- i need to hurry up so uh, i wanted uh, to talk say rishi kanada who wrote vaisheshika sutra and democritus very similar uh, similar uh, things in their uh, uh, in their in their philosophies wanted to talk about transmission to the greeks and romans ayurveda if you look at hippocrates he proposed a system here based on humors which is hot dry cold wet very very similar to the doshas of ayurveda over here and it's not surprising because hippocrates was a student of democritus and democritus over here was influenced by kanada so the ecosystem is right over there uh, post alexander we know that alexander ordered the translation of works in persia and mesopotamia for aristotle it was transmitted to hipparchus and hipparchus was a person who worked on uh, trigonometry supposed to be the father of trigonometry in fact they say aryabhatta learned his works in trigonometry from his uh, works but we know uh, there is a lot more to that story there's no time for me to talk about it but there's a lot more to his that story uh, Eratosthenes very very important figure who is regarded as a person who found the circumference of earth tilt of axis and other things such things but he was a person influenced by stoicism and plato who were influenced by pythagoras in turn and uh, he also was a chief librarian at alexandria 
the library at Alexandria was set up to transmit knowledge from the east to the west. In the medieval period, this person, Dioscorides, Greek physician, he wrote Materia uh, Medica with large number of Greek Indian herbs, recipes for drugs, used for 16 centuries in uh, Europe. Uh, the Byzantine emperor, when he persecuted Nestorians, they fled to Kerala. These became the Kerala Christians in 500 current era. And they were the source of transmission to Syria because they maintained contact with the bishop in Ed Edessa and so on. Nestorians and Greeks also fled to Jandishapur in uh, uh, Persia in 530 current era. And that was also a, a, a place where they met Indian physicians and a lot of transmissions. Persian king, before the Islamic era, Persian king Khosru Anishirwan, he sent his visor to India to get medical text. This is a statue in the Tehran courthouse. Eastern transmission, there's a whole lot of things. You can read uh, Sahana's book. It talks a lot about some data points and uh, various transmissions over here. Neoplatonism from Socrates onwards, onward to Ammonia, Saccas, Plotinus, and others. This influenced Christianity to a great deal to Augustine and Aquinas. Don't want to talk much over there. Uh, we talked a little bit about Muslim transmission. Al-Fazari, Manka, Abid Allah bin Ali. Al Kindi, all of these people were pe uh, uh, translators who took Brahmagupta's works, who took the uh, Ayurvedic works and so on, trans uh, translated them to Persian and to Arabic. These are all injected into Spain. And uh, we also know about uh, uh, Al Baruni and uh, uh, Zain Ul Abidin and Darashiko. All of these people also continue the transmissions. In 1200s to 1300s, we have records of missionaries, John of uh, this particular place, Catholic missionary in Mylapur, Jordanus Catalani, and this person from Ireland. We know in 1400s, a whole lot of Europeans like Niccolo di Conti and uh, other such people who, who came to India in various periods of time. In 1500s, we know from Vasco da Gama onwards, whole fleets of people coming to India, including scientists with them, who were uh, copying a lot of uh, Indian works. Colonial periods, whether it's the uh, Dutch or the Portuguese or the French or British, we have evidence, enormous amounts of works that they collected, transmitted to uh, Europe. Here's one example of medical knowledge transmission. Garcia de Dakota in Goa, who wrote uh, a book on Ayurveda, translated Latin by Clusius, this particular book. Dutch botanist Hendrik van Reed, he came to Malabar and wrote Hottest Malabaricus with Ayurvedic physician's help. Johann Koenig was a direct pupil of Carl Linnaeus. He went to India as a physician. He was a source for Carl Linnaeus' works in botany. And uh, Bartholomew Ziegenberg, this who, whose books are documented here. A whole lot of people. Uh, if, if you just go looking for this information, you find so much of information about Indian, Indic knowledge seeding the world knowledge systems. All of this, like I said, was transmitted into Europe, pushed into Europe by the Muslims into Spain. And in Spain, the, like I said, the Christians would translate that into Latin, and that Latin translation is what allowed the nobility of uh, 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 Europe to learn about their systems. I'm not going to talk about this. Here is an example of transmission from Aryabhata all the way to Copernicus. I got the entire DNA. I know the DNA, what works, who referred to, who was a professor of whom. All of those things are listed here, but I'm not going to read it. Too much to say over there. Concluding remarks. Transmission of knowledge out of India has not received scholarly attention, at least to the level it should. There's a multi-layered narrative that places Greece, Babylon as centers of math, astronomy, sciences. These things deserve critical attention. I've discussed uh, several periods from 3000 BC to current times when Indic knowledge seeded knowledge systems of various civilizations. I've discussed knowledge transfer and routes and instances of knowledge transfer. I'm aware that uh, by no means is this complete, and there is probably a lot, lot more we can talk, perhaps a two, three hour talk just on documenting some of these things. But uh, thank you very much for indulging this. Thank you. Thank you.